Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Brendan Goulston of Gresham House, one of the UK's finest small cap fund managers. So welcome, Brendan. Thanks, Paul. Good morning. Good to be back. Yeah, well, um, I say lots been happening since uh, we last spoke, not least the recent um, sort of all ongoing banking crisis, which uh, seems to have seriously spooked many investors in terms of the stability of the financial system and um, how that potentially could suck credit out the economy later in the year. So putting that together, what's your sort of like broad outlook for um, equities going forward? Yeah, look, there's clearly a few, there's a sort of quite a few ongoing kind of issues with, you know, certain parts of the market. Um, There's always, you know, the the UK and global equities is always an interesting space. It's never a dull moment. Um, I think that, I think my sort of understatement of the year that one. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> look, I think that the the key thing really is the the extent of the dislocation between what's actually going on in terms of fundamentals of companies that you know, particularly in the UK market, and then what's happening in terms of the sentiment. And I just think that those two factors have they continue to di- diverge so materially, um, and. You know, the latest sort of collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the kind of rescue of Credit Suisse, you know, if you look at the impact that that has on, you know, certain small cap UK stocks, you know, the share, some of the shares will be off 5% and there's there's no impact at all from a fundamental perspective. So I think what you've got at the moment is you've got really, you know, the kind of this negative sentiment kind of persists in terms of having this sort of adverse impact on stock prices. But what we're seeing is we're seeing a massive opportunity in terms of the underlying trading performance of businesses within our investment universe, which is really exciting. It's, you know, it's actually an ideal time to be sort of in, in the investment game, really. Mm. Yeah, you know, and I think we'll come on to some of those um, ideas. In fact, some of them, I think, will actually be beneficiaries of the volatility. So uh, we'll, we'll speak to that. But, but just sort of like in terms of sort of positioning the portfolio, because obviously there's a lot of sentiment shifting. And if we do get sort of the banking sector retrenching to improve their balance sheets, et cetera, as we did see, hopefully nowhere near to the same extent in the great financial crisis. I mean, that won't that sort of like increase the cost of capital for factoring into the prices? of shares alongside the sort of like the, the harder the harder times it's going to be to sort of like raise money for um for, for these businesses and, and putting that together how are you sort of like thinking about positioning the portfolio yeah look, i think that the you know the 2008 2009 crisis was i mean with hindsight was sort of easier to see something systemic going on in terms mm. of you know all of the the bad asset bad assets in the portfolios on the balance sheet. I think it's a bit harder at the moment when you have something like SVB, you know, kind of does, did anyone know that they had loads of, you know, instruments that were being marked to market and at a huge loss, potentially not, you know, maybe it was the business model that compounded that. But I think the challenge is, you know, you look at, so there's this kind of risk off type feeling towards the banking sector because, you know, people don't really know what's, you know, ultimately what's going on in, in the underlying sort of loan books and and the investments that they've made into, you know, bonds and other securities. So I think that's, it's much harder to unpick. I think, you know, it's quite, when I think about how we invest, you know, we, in, investment process is so so critical to, to how we go about investing and, and so important to our kind of risk adjusted returns. And, you know, key thing for us, around process is really just you have you're consistent and systematic and you you don't stray from your process you keep it objective we've never invested in the banking sector or the oil and gas sector or mining and you know the reason for that is because it's it's there's so many factors that you can't understand that are outside of your control you know if i just even look back over the last 3 years the banking sector you know, it was hugely in terms of UK dividend payers, banking sector was hugely relied upon. You then had a period during COVID when the PRA said, okay, no dividends to be paid by any banking stocks. And then, you know, as we came into a higher a sort of higher interest rate environment, suddenly people got excited about the banks again. And, you know, banks can't make money and rising interest rates. And when are they going to make money? And so if you look at the and, and now and now we're going through 
another kind of down period. But you know, ultimately, you know, we haven't invested in that sector at all, and we sort of missed out on this up and down and up and and <clears throat> so so I think you know for for me and for the way that we invest, just consistently not getting drawn into areas you don't understand, not deviating from process. That for us is a huge area of cutting out risk, um, and it just helps smooth our returns over the long term. Now, so sort of just moving on to sort of like one particular area that seems to have been a sort of like a beneficiary of this volatility is the sort of the financials and two stocks in particular. But let's start with a TPI cap because this is obviously all things into you know inter dealer broker type of activities, and particularly with it's got a strong position in interest rate. Um, um, uh, derivatives, OTC. Um, and this one really should be, as long as it's got a fairly neutral sort of, you know, book, et cetera, which I think it does run, then it sh- this extra volatility should should be should be very good for it, even though the shares have fallen quite hard recently. Yeah, look, th- I mean, this is, this is a great example of what I was sort of <clears throat> saying right at the outset in terms of the divergence between what's actually going on with the business and what the kind of market perceives or what the market's worried about. And again, you know, we, we you, you sort of expect that kind of dislocation between fundamentals and share prices when you're in the small cap world. But something like TPI cap, you know, it's a re- reasonable sized business. Um, and, you know, we were we were looking at this, I mean, we've, we've held it for a couple of years now, but there was a point that we were looking at it when I think the shares were sub one pound. Mm. when you know there was just such a risk off sort of set of appetite towards the business for some reason that it was kind of being priced as something like three times EBITDA as if the business was going to go bust and you had a business at that point which is a global leader in as a sort of highest market share in global broking something like a 50 percent market share it's got huge scale um you know what the services that they're providing as a sort of interdealer broker and not, you know, this is not an area where they're suddenly going to go out to business. You know, there are some challenges around how, you know, the costs with to do with some of the broking individuals and how do you sort of offset those over time, but it's not a kind of systemic risk that, Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you, you know, you're also in a period where suddenly, as you said, kind of volatility, you know, a, a, a sort of perennial kind of low interest rate environment's not great for them. As they make their money off, you know, transaction volumes, and you know, you start entering into a period where suddenly interest rates are going up. There's more volatility in currency. All of that creates activity, and that wasn't being reflected in the, you know, in the share price at all. Um, and the other interesting thing about TPI cap, which puts a complete floor on the valuation, is that they've got a data business, which they they take all the data from the OT, the sort of specialist OTC contracts that they deliver. And it's a unique data set, and they sell, you know, they sell these sort of recurring data solutions for, you know, for w- within a business that makes something like 160 million of annual recurring revenue, and it's at 40% EBIT margin. It's growing double digit at a top line level, so you know your drop through is extremely high. And at the time, you know, we looked at that, and that was basically worth the entire market cap of the business and you know fast forward a year or so later and the shares are you know are up 60 or 70 percent but you know so that for us at that at point in time was just completely the wrong price and being priced as if it was going to go bust and it's now you know just had a, a few upgrades doing well there's more volatility um you know so i still think it's an exciting business to be invested in really. yeah no, i mean i'm looking at the share i mean looking at the actual valuation it's still on less than seven times pe and um I'm with you. It's it's been unfairly sold off. Another one which seems to have done the same is our Gentex, which has gone through yeah. a really sort of transformation over the last year. It does sort of like um, forex um, um, sort of like activities for for hedge funds and for um, but mainly for, for for normal commercial businesses, and also is putting on its sort of technology. I think expanding mm. abroad, etc. And, and again, I mean, it, it did well in that sort of like um, LDI um, sort of like uh, volatility, and, and probably will do the same and but, the, but regardless of that the business is doing really well anyway it seems about seems as though but the, the shares have unfairly sold off yeah look again volatility is really helpful for someone like our gentex they provide your know, corporate currency solutions um they make their commission 
you know, every time they execute on a transaction. Um, you know, if I, was, I think the business, you know, during COVID, there was a bit more, and I showed a bit more uncertainty from some of their customers, um, which meant that, you know, their expectations on growth were moderated slightly. Although, you know, to put it into context, we're still talking kind of 20% profit growth, you know, so come down from maybe something like 30 to 20. Um, I think there was, you know, the, the business was probably a little bit underinvested historically, particularly in the technology side. Um, we spent quite a lot of time working with the management team on sort of understanding all the areas that, you know, they needed to kind of improve on and, and how they were going to build out the sort of operational scalability. Um, and, you know, so they spent quite a bit of time doing that. They, you know, there's a sort of significant amount of, of change in terms of people. Um, <clears throat> they've invested quite heavily into their tech, um, into their compliance. So just allowing them to now kind of have a, a really robust platform from which they can scale. And, you know, all of that was happening in the background. Market was sort of unaware of it. But you also had, similarly to TPI cap, you had to kind of, you know, this headwind in terms of, you know, not much volatility and inertia. You had that completely sort of changed to becoming a tailwind. Um, and, you know, I think the shares were down at 70 or 80p. But it was clear that performance within the business was going to be a you know, step change from historical performance. And last year, you saw that come through. I think you know, there were a series of upgrades to earnings. Shares have gone up a bit and come back a bit. You know, it's still, you know, if you compare to something like an Alpha FX, which is trading on about three times the multiple, you know, it's, it's just the, the valuation opportunity in a business which is, you know, much more scalable, well positioned, performing well is, you know, is, is really attractive. And you've we've also got that, you know, the drop through margin on on revenue growth is significant. It's, it's huge. Yeah, I and mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, both businesses should be doing well um, in, in this volatility, and the shares have been knocked off. So, and they're both trading at really good as compared to in absolute terms and in relative terms. Now, just again, another one in the sort of financial, just to finish that one off, is Fintel, which is basically, again, a sort of mm -hmm. like a data service provider, lots of recurring revenue streams for the sort of like the retail um, investment landscape. I think it provides information on funds to IFAs so they can advise their yeah. clients and also provides effectively product providers with um, with distribution and how to help their designs and stuff. So, do you want to take us through this one? Because, again, it's sort of like being a bit of the baby in the bathwater, actually. Yeah. I mean, look, this, this business has evolved. It perhaps is, you know, it's evolved fairly substantially over time. And it's, you know, it's, it's evolved from being, so historically it used to be a kind of outsourced compliance service provider to IFAs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that in itself is, you know, used to be called Simply Biz. Yeah. That is, you know, that's an attractive proposition. It's in a part of the market where the, you know, demand for those services is structurally growing. You know, so it's not like that's a kind of unexciting place to be. Um, but what they did is they have have kind of evolved into this two-sided digital technology and data platform for fund buyers and for fund management fund management groups, as you said. And that was through the acquisition of de facto. Um, you know, I think that, you know, suddenly that kind of step changes. The business from you know not just being a kind of you know strong growth kind of outsourced services business but also to being a kind of platform provider in in the tech space you've got you've you've had sort of balance sheet deleveraging over time you know it's cash generative you've had a few non-core asset disposals so the if you look at the quality of earnings is increasing materially that subscription and the SaaS revenue is is rising over time and you've got you know strong strong revenue growth and you know you should have a potential re-rating from all of that and you probably haven't seen that happen yet but i think it's just it's an example of a, a really well positioned business that's you know is, is kind of making material advances in terms of the attractiveness of the asset and you know, ultimately you've got to be patient and over time that should re-rate and you know so i think so i think there's you know, it's just a kind of good long-term hold, really, that business. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's got tailwinds, doesn't it? They're always yeah. tweaking the regulations in terms of, you know, duty of care to retail investors and likewise changing the budget, as we saw <laughs> last week, which is anything with big material change has got to help the um, that data sort of data provider. 
Now, yeah. just moving to another excellent area, uh, healthcare. One stop that um, ha- again has been has, has come off really through a sort of like a, it had a few challenges it is and it's, as it's moved from a sort of like a you know COVID beneficiary it is EKF Diagnostics, and I think it's trading at roughly around about twenty six twenty p twenty seven p now. Um, it's come back from about eighty or so at, at sort of height. What's your sort of latest on this one? Because again, compared to peers, it seems to be on very attractive valuation in terms of e- EV EBITDA. But actually, um, you know, it's on trough earnings as well. So what is the latest on this one? Yeah, look, they, you know, EKF, they made quite a lot of money during COVID Mm. out of sort of leveraging some of their facilities to manufacture reagents and sort of clinical supplies for COVID testing. It was never part of, you know, kind of strategic part of the business. It It was kind of sweating the asset base to generate cash to invest in, the core part of the business in the, in the life sciences division, which they're actively growing, that somehow didn't get quite reflected into what the market was forecasting. So, you, you know, you had this kind of this unfortunate situation where when COVID testing went away, a substantial amount of revenues, which shouldn't have been forecasted, went away. And then the shares came off from 80p to about 30p. You know, it did have a profit warning relatively recently which was mm. partly related to that but it was more that the you know as they were shifting in some of their non-core areas as, as they were shifting away from COVID testing to other types of testing that's just had taken longer than expected I think my take on the business is that those non-core areas kind of not part of my investment case at all the reason why this business is interesting is because you've got a core diagnostics business with a very large installed base, a very efficient route to market via McKesson and other big distributors, which is growing, you know, this is growing sort of 15 to 20% revenue growth per year, mostly kind of consumables. So pretty good visibility on those revenue streams. Um, Very cash generative as well. You've then got, you've then got an exciting high growth businesses called their life sciences business. Mm. Which, you know, this is a this is leveraging the core bit of IP within EKF is their ability to make these certain types of enzymes and fermented reagents, and there is a huge opportunity in the US as an outsource, a sort of CDMO outsource provider into the pharmaceutical industry, where people need scale, they need these specialist reagents, and you know the cost and the know-how that you have to put in to do that is is significant. Um, you know, and so people are looking for someone who's reputable, who can you know, provide these services. And, and you know, if you look at, if you unpick the sort of end market drivers as well, they're also, you know, this is in certain areas like molecular enzymes and reagents, which is a hugely, far, you know, a hugely, hugely growing part of, of the market as well. So you've got that as a natural tailwind. Um, that part of the business is much higher margin. It's more specialist. Um, and you know, so the, you know, from, from my perspective, you've got a core business that's performing well, growing well over time. Plus, you've got this higher margin life sciences division. You know, which if it hits the expectations that are expected of it, it's going to hugely change the kind of the overall profitability of the group. And the overall group, if you look at that, as you said, look, that's trading on something like seven times EBITDA mm. on compressed EBITDA. Yeah. And, you know, they may be flat for a year, but it's 20% EBIT margin business, cash generative, net cash position. You know, you've got at least 50% upside just in the valuation, probably more than that. Plus, you've got the earnings growth. So, you know, this is potentially, you know, it's a two to three X probably from here. Yeah. No, 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 I would agree, and it, it, I wouldn't be surprised at some point in time if somebody took a, a shot at it, a shot at it, you know, sort of because it's just a, a good, high quality asset trading at a, a really low valuation. Another, another company in the sort of the um, the life sciences area is Diaceutics, which I don't think many people know much about, but uh, it seems to be the sort of the, the one of the world's number one. Um, platforms that connect all the sort of the the pharmaceutical testing um, or diagnostics uh, labs with with actual big pharma to allow them to accelerate the development 
of their drug pipeline. So, for instance, if I think if you're a, if you're something like Amgem and you're releasing a you know a new a new drug and it needs a diagnostic, a companion diagnostic, then this the, 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 the diacetics will actually help that particular say Amgem release that product with with the actual test at the right labs in the right places to the right people. Yeah, yeah. Look, the, the again, I think this is really sort of overlooked diacetics. I think. You know, you've got, as you said, the proposition. If you look at how drug companies are producing drugs, the you know the the most the pipeline is shifting pretty dramatically towards therapies having a test, a diagnostic test. Mm. You know, if you have the way that people are looking at oncology is it's not you know lung cancer is not a single indication. There are multiple different types of small cell lung cancer. You know, there's four or five tests, probably more, to work out what kind of treatment. Do you need what what's the patient pathway look like and it's just not that you know that is not being done well at all and there's a lack of knowledge around how to test there's a lack of data um and diacetics have you know they've got themselves into this position as a you know as a, da- a provider of that sort of data analytics to pharma to tell them how to increase the opportunity for them mm. by ensuring people are tested appropriately in the right way and they're also helping the the kind of research labs make sure that they know how to test so it's a really you know the 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 market is enormous um it's growing very fast you know there's huge appetite for what they're doing i think you know one of the most interesting things is that if you look at the share price has probably been flat for two or three years yeah if you look at what the business has <clears throat> accomplished in those in, in that time is it's pretty remarkable. So when we first invested, they had four four modules that they sold. I think they've got 19 or more. Right. Um, so they've built out, they've seen all this additional functionality that they can sell to their pharma clients. They estimate that that's increased the target addressable market by five times for each customer. And they've started to demonstrate their ability to to extract more value from customers so if you look at the contract sizes that they're announcing you know they are much bigger than the ones that would have been announcing two three years ago um you've then got you know the i think the other key thing which we've been sort of advocating with the business is historically the sale had been more ad hoc more sort of services element and we'd sort of always been uh, we'd always been kind of supportive of trying to move to a you know this is a data platform with analytics we should be selling this on a subscription basis and that has been a strategic objective of the group over the last year or two and they've i think they're almost at 40 percent of Mm. total revenue from zero which is now subscription based and i think it's going to be 60 percent by the end of the year um you know so you take a step back for a minute you look at this business and it's you know it's making 20 million revenue probably a bit more it's 86 percent gross margin you know, if you get that, that it's, it's growing revenue, you know, had upgrades at the end of last year, stronger revenue growth, huge demand for what they've got. If you, if you start to get that, you know, the recurring element north of 60, 70 percent, you've got a business which is hugely valuable. And, you know, the other thing that we've been testing is what's the kind of strategic value within this business? How might pharma look at what they're doing and how interesting is it and you know we've had some really positive conversations um you know in, in within industry around the potential st- strategic value of the business so you know again i think that's one that's you know as a kind of three four year yeah. hole is is super exciting yeah no it's got plenty of cash and the move to sort of personalized medicine has got to be beneficial for the uh, for the business yeah now, plenty, not, plenty not, of cash but <clears throat> all of it was in silicon valley bank so there was a sort of, <laughs> there was a, a, a weekend of um much anxiety no i'm sure yeah well luckily the uh, the u.s government uh, stood up didn't it to the plate so um, it helped yeah. everybody out <laughs> Um, now, uh, Medica or, or Medica, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, which does sort of like all things um, teleradiology. I mean, I'm guessing it's absolutely boom time because of the huge amount of elective procedures which need to be sort of like performed, particularly in the UK. Uh, can you take us through this one? I, I guess the hard bit is actually recruiting enough uh, people. Yeah. 
So, I mean, this is a great example of, I think, one, if I take a step back, a feature in the market that we're seeing is, um, we're, we're seeing the, the multiple arbitrage between the private and public markets is significant. Yeah. There's so much dry powder in terms of private equity capital that has to be deployed. Mm. You know, we're, <clears throat> if you look at the vintages, you still got a huge amount of capital from 2020 and 2021 vintages that <laughs> the clock is ticking on that on that capital to be deployed. And, you know, we have the fortunate position of being able to look at companies that are on the public market, but through our private equity team, we can, can cover the same sectors. We can see what private assets are, are selling for. And so we can build up a picture of actually you know, what's the extent of the arbitrage? And, and Medica is a great example of where there is a real opportunity there. So, you know, the business is a, it's a market leader in terms of outsourced teleradiology services in the UK, the structurally underserved market, there's huge demand um, for their services. And in, in particular, there's a growing demand for sort of clinical imaging and they bought a business in the, in the US, which provides that exposure in the sort of clinical space, which mm. we actually think is a really, you know, it's probably the most exciting part of the business. That's clinical um, trials, yeah. Yeah, so specialist yeah. imaging for clinical trials, yeah. um, <clears throat> which, you know, as a kind of structural trend, embracing imaging analytics earlier on, doing more of it throughout the process is, you know, it cuts time and saves money during trials. So, you know, that we're seeing as a, a big driver for, the sort of pharmaceutical companies, but also the CROs that are delivering those those trials. The, it, and you know, the team is so really high quality team at Medica. They're they're investing in a digital platform, driving productivity and and operational efficiencies, as well as leveraging kind of third party AI solutions. Um, mm. Yeah, so just trying to, you know, this is not a business that is kind of stuck in the in the dark ages in terms of just you know individuals just reading you know <clears throat> reading scans um you know this is really a, a sort of business that's leveraging current technology advances and automation um mm. and ultimately you know you look at the business and it's it's trading on i don't know nine ten times EBITDA probably that's correct yeah and if you look at the private market we have seen you know businesses being sold to private equity for sort of 40 to 50 percent higher mm, yeah um yeah and for the market one of the sort of market leads in the uk with the clinical trial business in the us it just doesn't seem like the right price um so we think you know there's plenty of upside for for medica really yeah no well i think all those three in the healthcare sector uh, should people have a good look at because uh They've both got they've all, all of them have got really strong positions in their niche markets and lots yeah. of recurring revenue stream and and an EBITDA drop through. Now, just moving or um, shifting gears to all things technology, Active Ops, which basically does sort of like um, automation software for banks and insurers and for business process outsourcers to help them do things like I think it's know your customer and also sort of quite complex areas like uh, anti money laundering, etc. And this one. Again, listed, I think, probably in during COVID with the, with, the, with the lockdowns, but as and, and the shares have been sold off, but now it's reaching EBITDA profitability and still mm. growing. It's double digit. It's it's a SaaS business, I think. Do you want to take us through your latest views on this one because it just seems to be turning now? Yeah, look, it's a great business, ActiveOps. It's as you said, it's a SaaS business, enterprise software. So mm. what they do is they are essentially an orchestration layer for usually for sort of quite big corporates. Yeah. Um, and they so they sort of plug into some of the central systems within large organizations. So Pega back office system, they plug into the workday sort of capacity and workforce management system. And they essentially <clears throat> allow customers to sort of optimize inventory, capacity, workforce across you know, where you have disparate teams, but also where you have, you know, this hybrid working environment. Mm. Um, and, you know, so actually during COVID was probably a net positive for them, despite the fact that some of the implementation services reduced because people couldn't be on site. But you know, if you think about how, how people work now, it's much more hybrid model. It's much harder to track, you know, within the back office 
in a large financial services business, it's really difficult to track if someone is completing the tasks, you know, at the right time and when they're going to be off because you don't see them every day. And then, yeah, so it, it's just, it's a kind of mission critical bit of software with a great customer base, which has just grown solidly, double digit growth, ARR growth, sort of year on year. Um the yeah, you know, the share price has not it's gone the other way, probably, despite yeah. the fact that as you said, they're getting to EBITDA break even. You know, the, the management team are really sensible, really cautious. They're you know, they've been very disciplined on sort of deployment of cash. You know, they've got, I think they had something like eleven million pounds worth of net cash at the the latest interims. Um, you know, so this is a business which is well capitalized, it's 80% gr- gross margin. Um and you know strong growth with you know the the, the market opportunity is significant for them, um, and it's sort of what trading on two two times yeah. ARR or two and a half times ARR. Yeah. Um, you know, so again, we just think that is it's a high quality, high recurring, very low churn, high margin business with net cash that is undervalued. And you know, I think, uh, the other thing I would say. So going back to your point at the start around you know, the banking sector and cost of capital. If you look across how, if you look across our portfolios, you know, most most of them are the companies that have sort of in an average net cash position. Mm, yeah. And where there is financial leverage, it is really limited across the portfolios. And I think that's got to be a great place to be really, because you, know, you don't want to be, you want to, you want to have optionality. You don't want to be reliant on funding from, banks when you have you know banks collapsing and you know that just from our perspective that's always been how we you know how we invest is we you know we're not financial leverage is a is you know just a if it's significant it adds undue risk to situations and it creates a you know a range of outcomes that is suddenly not as narrow it's you know greater volatility so i think that you know with a lot of these businesses you know diacetics net cash you know most of these are kind of strong net cash position Type businesses, which is really, yeah, it's really helpful in the current environment, particularly. Yeah, um, another one which has got a lot of net cash in the sort of tech space is um, is net call, and and as you yeah. as you rightly point out, not only it sort of like um, it reduces the tail risk if you've got the cash, but also it acts as a sort of competitive advantage because your rivals who haven't got the cash have got yeah. to spend all that <laughs> distracted trying to raise it. But but just moving to sort of to, to net call, this is another one I've sort of missed because I think traditionally it was a sort of like a call center software type of business, but now yeah. it makes more of its revenues, I believe through uh through you know intelligent um, automation of sort of like uh, uh, similar to you know sort of active ops and the shares have done really well yeah again there's a company that yeah as you said it wasn't the sexiest of businesses basically a long years ago ago. yeah yeah a long time ago sort of selling on-premise call center software basically um this is a business that's you know it's been on a on a journey on a big transition um, you know, it now, look, if you, <clears throat> this business is sort of selling into the kind of digital transformation, driving operational efficiencies within large organizations. The key thing for them has been moving away from that on-premise, more kind of legacy type software to selling on a kind of recurring subscription model at the same time. And, and they have executed that amazingly well over the last couple of years. <clears throat> Um, the other thing they did is they bought a low-code software business. Right. So they have they sort of broadened out their proposition into this kind of digital transformation solution where they're leveraging intelligent automation, you know, leveraging RPA, and they're sort of taking customers through this journey of, you know, trying to trying to automate more, trying to cut out costs, um, and they're doing that. Kind of in the cloud, like all, all on a on a recurring basis. So, you know, I think the team has made enormous advances in the quality of the earnings that the business now generates. And last year, I think in June last year, they won, I think, their largest ever contract was a nineteen million dollar contract. I think seven million dollars of it was ARR um, for a business of their size. I, you know, that was completely transformational and it just sort of sets the tone of you know there's probably there's probably not a hundred contracts that he can win like that 
Mm. But, you know, there's more than one. And it shows you the direction of travel in terms of the amount that these customers are willing to pay to go on this, you know, long to, longer term journey, how strong that trend is and how well positioned NetCall are, in, you know, in terms of being able to deliver that sort of large scale digitization. So, you know, we, again, we think that this business is super well positioned. You know, if you look back a few years ago, I think the shares were on something like 20, what was it 30p or something? Yeah, that was the last time I looked at I missed it because I, I can't remember where they are now. So sort of just over a pound, aren't they? So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well done. I think there's more to go, though. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm with you. If they can win that type of size contract for a, what, 160 million odd market cap company, then yeah. uh, it says everything about the quality of the software and the implementation and the, uh, the sort of the cloud vision. Now, one um, sort of company that I've never really looked at is Access Intelligence, which again is a sort of software recurring revenue stream for all things sort of journalists and press, et cetera. And I think it sort of aggregates online or social media and uh, prints sort of actual you know physical printed press and <clears throat> gives out insights and stuff to journalists and stuff like that one thing which are, which all sounds great one thing it does about 60 70 million a turnover but i can't under, can't get my yeah. head around for recurring why the margins are, are so comparatively so low yeah so yeah the business is sort of it's a SaaS business, which does kind of, as you said, media monitoring. So from various sources, digital, social, print. Um, and it's sort of a software platform that allows corporates, governments to sort of manage their reputation, but also monitor, you know, certain intelligence and media trends. Um, it's been, it's a business that's sort of under, undergone quite a few acquisitions. Um, the, the kind of, so part part of the reason why the margin's slightly lower is that they, you know, they do rely on sort of certain data feeds. So the gross margin is lower than uh, it's, it's not okay. true, you know, it's not your true kind of software or SaaS, you know, 85 to 90 percent margin. Um, but it's not 50 percent margin. Um, and that's just a fixed cost that has over time it's got, you know, the margin margin has gone up as you've had some, you know, some operational leverage. Um, I think the margin is something like 70% of the gross margin. Um, <clears throat> I think, look, the business, you know, it's grown significantly since we invested in it. They've done, they haven't had the easiest ride. So they did an acquisition in, in Australia, um, <clears throat> which, you know, there were huge synergy potential from that acquisition. Um, <clears throat> but what they saw was they saw some higher churn in some of the, you know, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, and particularly from some of the government contracts. So that's been a bit tougher in terms of, you know, kind of <clears throat> executing on, on, on that kind of integration of that business. Um, but, you know, the CEO is based out in Australia. She's entirely focused on delivering that. Um, and, you know, ultimately the amount, the amount of, of sort of revenue that was churned, it, you know, what it was enough to have a profit warning, but it's not sort of, systemic to the kind of the sort of viability of the overall business and you still got you know they didn't massively overpay for the acquisition and you still got a business now which is much you know much bigger much broader mm. um and you know again this is i think less than one and a half times they are yeah, yeah. um you look at the competitors in the space and they've got real scale now versus the competitors in the space who are you know trading at you know, at least double that kind of multiple. So, um, so yeah, there's probably a bit of perception around, you know, obviously you have a, tr uh, a bit more churn and profit warning and people think, oh, the company's lost its way. But, you know, ultimately I think the fundamentals there are pretty strong. Mm. What sort of like terminal or, or steady state margin should it get to for sort of like, is it traditional? I mean, you'd expect it 20% plus free EBITDA margins, if, you know, eventually? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that you would probably expect the gross margin to go up a bit more as revenue grows. They don't <clears throat> wouldn't have to put too much into the sort of ongoing data costs. It's fairly fixed, as I say. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd like to think the sort of twenty percent EBITDA margin is achievable for that type of business, um, and that shouldn't be. You know, that should be not five years away. Um, yeah, it's okay. probably not this year. Okay, good. And then, then just moving again to sort of like another category killer. Um, Winwood, which I think listed um, on the market on AIM about 18 months ago, and it's sort of a category killer in all things sort of like marine 
um, data. So I think it, basically it's software and it's um, it's data collection allows sort of like um, big sort of like shippers or insurance companies to see which cargo is going in which particular ship at which particular location to be able to track it. Do you want to take us through this one? Because it's got lots of cash and it's obviously, you know, got a really, you know, useful service, particularly with sanction busting out of Russia. Um, yeah. and, uh, uh, but it needs to get to profitability. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> as you say, when there was... <clears throat> it was quite interesting looking at the software when there were some various lockdowns and the um, ships stuck, you know, in yes. whichever canal they were stuck in, and you just yeah, there's... you can see the extent of the of the shambles that was going on. Um, but yeah, look, their platform is is really interesting. It's you know, it's kind of it provides this predictive intelligence around maritime assets. It allows you to track assets and monitor ships. It allows government insurance companies to also sort of monitor the kind of document control for mm. passing various, you know, <clears throat> customs and, and and such like. And, you know, the business has grown, you know, it's grown materially since the IPO. I think it's making $25 million of ARR, mostly recurring, high margin, you know, it's a, it is, as you say, a category killer. There's not that many companies that are doing this. The, the demand and the structural growth is really exciting. It's got net cash position and it's 38 million pounds market cap, I think. Mm, yeah. So again, kind of, you know, definitely below one and a half times ARR, but closer to probably one when you factor in net cash. So, you know, I just think that this is a long-term growth opportunity. It's a really attractive asset. It's got the ability to be really profitable as well. Mm. Um, and so, you know, again, that's kind of one that, I guess we're looking at thinking it's probably the wrong price and yeah. Happy what's, to what's, what's the management team like on it? Um, they're very passionate. Mm. They, yeah. So they're sort of from the industry. I think it's an Israeli management team. Um, yeah. Just, very, you know, very committed, kind of, very, very sort of myopically focused on what they do. They yeah. truly live and breathe there. Um, and yeah, they're just continuing to sort of, deliver on the strategy really good uh, and then another one um, in that sort of tech area the last one is oxford metrics which uh, i think has been a fantastic sort of like a realization of uh, of hidden value in that business and uh, it's it sits on an enormous amount pile of cash i think yeah yeah they so they used they had two divisions yotta which was a sort of software mm. business into the kind of physical asset management space selling to local authorities and then Vicon, which is Vicon's like a specialist in motion measurement across a range of different industries, sell mm. hardware and software. They sold Yotta um, <clears throat> for for you know I think it's something like seven times revenue, so yeah, really great price. And you know they got they got something like seventy million, I think sixty to seventy million of cash on the balance That's correct. sheet, and. Yeah, we looked at this, I think, when the business was about 100 million market cap. You see, you had an EV of about 30 million. And they just had a profit downgrade, which was due to kind of the supply chain, meaning that they couldn't ship their, their hardware for Vicon. Mm -hmm. um, we did a bit of work on that. And we sort of realized quite quickly that it was entirely transitory. And the business within Vicon was rebounding very strongly from COVID and trading really well. And, you know, that's, that was sort of starting to come through and was, you saw they had a record pipeline and, you know, demand is really strong Vicon. And so you sort of look at the business and you're thinking 30 million EV, you've got, you know, forecast 8 million EV bit DAR from Vicon, mm. I think, for 2023. Yeah. Um, plus, you know, you still got some, there, there's some duplicated cost in that business from, you know, probably from the legacy kind of structure with Yotta and Vicon. And so, you know, we could, we could see basically a 10 million EBITDA plus type business. So you like trading on three times EBITDA mm. and Vicon. Yeah. This is not, this is not a three time, a three times EBITDA business. This is, it's got a huge amount of IP huge amount of you know market leading technology and motion measurement very exciting business so it was just completely the wrong price 
for us. And we we started buying it. I mean, the shares, it's quite hard to buy any shares and they kept going up. But um, Probably you, <laughs> pushing yeah. the price up. Probably. Um, so what are they going to do with that cash pile? I mean, are they going to make a big acquisition or is the idea to uh, to share it a bit with, um, with, with obviously, investors? Yeah, I don't think they're going to go and do a big acquisition. I don't think they're going to take on that kind of risk. I think that, you know, they might... There's some areas where they want to acquire into for the, for the Vicon business, um, but I wouldn't expect to see 50, 60 million of that go on acquisitions, maybe 10 or 50, yeah, okay. possibly. Um, they're, yeah, they're going to be relatively sensible in how they deploy. I mean, when you're trading on, if you're trading on that multiple, then you can't go buying expensive technology businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, another one, I'm just in Let's sort see. of... A- yeah, another one in sort of like all things decarbonisation is uh, smart metering systems, which is about a sort of like a one point two billion pound business. But I think it's been implementing throughout the UK all the smart meters. In fact, I'm probably a customer. I've got one which I've had for about sort of since the cost of living crisis. But it also does sort of like EV charging points and um, I think battery sort of like commercial scale battery farms and stuff like that on a recurring revenue stream. And this one seems to be again sort of knocking the ball out of the park. Yeah. Um... Yeah, look, they, you know, they've got the, as you said, the smart metering business, which I think now is making almost a hundred million in sort mm. of index-linked annualized recurring revenue. Yeah, they've got two, oh, just over two million units or in the field, which they've, they've installed and are now monitoring yeah. and servicing, etc. Yeah, and they've got another fifty million from their contracted pipeline as well. So, yeah. you know, they've got hundred, almost one hundred and fifty million. Of ILAR, um, which you know that is ninety-two percent cash gross margin. Yeah. Okay. So obviously they have to, you know, they have to invest to to deploy those smart meters. But at some at some point in time they won't need to, and mm. you know it's going to be hugely profitable revenue stream. Um, but so I think you got you know the other interesting thing with that is that it's it's RPI linked. So you know, yeah. in April. That's probably going up by ten or eleven percent. Yeah, um, their cost base isn't going up by ten or eleven percent. Yeah, um, and then the other part of the business, as you said, battery storage. You know that is performing really, really well. You know that is so. When they first launched that sort of battery storage part of the business, the guidance was sort of forty. I think forty-two to fifty-three thousand pounds of EBITDA per megawatt. Yeah, yeah, and. They have been delivering 123,000 pounds of EBITDA per megawatt over the last year, and that's been purely because of the type of service that they've been providing has moved from doing the kind of balancing service to the frequency response service, which is much higher margin. Mm. That's not going to last forever, but they've already upped their guidance from the sort of 42 to 53,000 estimate to 57 to 65, and that's because. You know the demand for the the core balancing services is going up over time. There's just a huge mismatch in you know the supply and demand, and there's not enough of these assets to actually ba- balance the energy on the national grid. So, um, you know, so we see long term we see that being more profitable. But in you know in the next, I don't know when it's going to stop in terms of the kind of supernormal profits and super normal returns but this 123,000 EBITDA probably will continue for a bit longer not for five years but um but yeah there's and you know there's a huge opportunity in the UK um in terms of those battery storage assets as well yeah and no, I'm with you I mean you, all you got to do is a, you know you, we're, we're looking to store renewable energy somewhere and commercial scale sort of like you know battery farms make absolute perfect sense whether it's locally for residential or for, for businesses because uh then you just produce out sort of green energy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I could only see that doing well. Now, very last one, thing, because I know we're running out of time, is uh, is Trufin, which is a bit of a special situation, which has done re- – it's knocked the ball out of the park in terms of its, all its agreements um, with us, say, say, Sartago, which does sort of like um, early invoice sort of discounting for the likes of Lloyd's and has got a partnership with, um, with, with, with Sage and stuff like that. But it did also get a bid for its other division, I think, oxygen yeah. of about 26 million so you'll take us through this one because i was almost quite surprised i know they said i was surprised they didn't take the 26 mil yeah look this is this is a, it's a special set it's completely the wrong price 
it's mm. really really interesting you've got yeah so you've got oxygen which is you know this is a sort of early payments provider yeah to the local right. authority space um and you know i think they've just reported something like five million revenue and 1.1 million EBITDA. Mm. Um, the business model <clears throat> it's is massively scalable. So the operational leverage is significant. As they, you know, from this point as they grow, you're probably going to get, you know, 50% plus drop through into onto EBITDA. Mm. And you know, you've got a sort of addressable market, which is yeah, the, the target addressable market for what they've got at the moment isn't billions, but you know it's 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 significant enough for that business to grow to be twice or three times the size from a revenue perspective. Um, that means from a profit perspective, you could quite e- easily see this business go from making a million EBITDA to five million EBITDA in a couple of years potentially. Mm. Yeah, um, they had a, yeah, so they had an offer for the business that. At, I think it was 26 million, as you said. That's right. Um, I think it was about 29p a share. I think, you know, when <clears throat> at the time the share price was something like 55p. Mm. And, you know, so if you look at that business, I guess management were probably thinking 26 million on a million of EBITDA optically is, you know, is, is quite an attractive price. But 26 million at, you know, for a company that, is making 50% EBITDA margin and makes 5 million EBITDA probably isn't a great price. And, mm. you know, I think that the visibility on that is, is quite strong. So, um, yeah, okay. you know, we see that as being, you know, that as being a real positive. Um, you then got Sotago, which again, you mentioned, which has got, you know, you had Lloyd's bank invested at 25 million pound mm. valuation. So, you know, if you take that as a flip, Law between Oxygen and Sotago, that's kind of the entire market cap of the business. You've got yeah. a bit of cash in the business as well. Um, but we think the opportunity for Sotago is you know, again, the operation operational leverage is significant. You know, it's a lend, it's a software platform, so lending as a service has pivoted from doing a bit of its own lending, but it is really well embedded with Lloyd's now and it has a partnership with Sage. I think they're going through the kind of about to go through the customer onboarding process with. Lloyd's, you know, if you assume one percent penetration with their SME customer base, you're at thirteen million of revenue, mm. and you're at forty to fifty percent EBITDA margin, probably. You know, again, again, so well for a business then that can make four or five million EBITDA, possibly more from such low penetration rates, and you think is that worth twenty five? No, it's probably worth double that at least. Mm. Um, you know, so it's, the, these businesses are, are massively scalable. They're really great at the the kind of niche in terms of serving the niche that they they serve, um, and then you've got Playstack and Virtus, two other businesses. But you know you don't even really need to talk about those because the other two give yeah. you enough upside as it is. So I think it's just yeah, people maybe aren't looking at it in a lot of detail, but I think it's hugely undervalued that. And as you said, the businesses are you know they're performing really well. Mm. Yeah, and no, I did notice on some of the parts bases, Liberum reckon it's worth over 120p, so uh, <laughs> plenty of upside there. All right, well, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, um, Brendan. If, if anybody wants to invest in the Gresham House funds, um, how, how best to do it? Probably best to speak to some of our sales team, so I'm not sure I'm allowed to sort of make it. Oh, okay, we'll go on the website or something like that. Yeah, I guess. I'm, allowed, I'm, I'm allowed to promote stocks as much as I like, I think, but okay, yeah. Um, yeah, look, they go onto the website and there'll be. Some plenty people, of stuff. Yeah, plenty of people's yeah. contact details. Yeah, well, there's a brilliant selection there of um, excellent sort of like, you know, potential, you know, medium, long-term stock ideas, significantly undervalued, and I'll be having a good look through those. And if anybody wants to sort of follow those companies, just hit the button on the website, on the WOX website, because you'll get all the information then straight into your uh, into your uh, inbox. So thanks very much, um, Brendan, and look forward in touch and base again in six months' time. Great. Thanks, Paul.